good day guys welcome to this anatomy recall session from your nec 2022 exam right so i had tried to compile questions anatomy questions from both the sessions morning and afternoon session and i've close to 30 okay close to 30 questions got and i'll be discussing it now with you okay so no turning back whatever over is over right and uh, looking ahead so what we can do with these questions okay so whatever be the type of competitive exam the topic of importance is always the same okay so looking on to the questions now yeah this was asked right match the following cooper cell parietal cell clara cell and dust cell and here you have the options lung liver bronchiole and stomach so this is important and one thing i want to mention you as i told you all these like close to 30 questions luckily like everything has been dealt in area plexus okay everything has come from the workbook i can tell you like with much confidence 100% of these questions like it is from the area plexus workbook and everything has been discussed with you so hope you made it all right okay <clears throat> so coming to this question yeah it is very important this was also a repeat question okay like now it has been asked as a match the following we'll look into the some details about this question and then come to the answer so where do you find cooper cell cooper cell are found in the liver right so you can get a histology image of the liver where this is the central vein and from the central vein you can see plates of hepatocytes radiating out these hepatocytes can have more than one nuclei also in between the plate of the hepatocytes you, you see this empty space yeah this is the hepatic sinusoid that's going to be filled with the blood okay so as seen here these are the hepatocytes and this is the sinusoids okay like anywhere else the sinusoids here is also lined by the endothelial cell the flat squamous cell but apart from these endothelial cells you can also get to see these irregular shaped large cells the cooper cells okay these are the macrophages so where do you get to find the cooper cells in the liver in the liver sinusoid right so while talking about the histology of liver certain other questions was also important which you can expect in the upcoming exams and i want to discuss with you those questions also yeah heard about the space of dizzy what is space of dizzy the space of dizzy is nothing but the space that surrounds the sinusoids that is the space which lies between the hepatocytes and the sinusoids okay so we will call this also as peri sinusoidal space now what does this peri sinusoidal sinusoidal space contain yes a special type of cells can you see here the hepatic skeletal cells which is also called the ecto cells what is special about these ecto cells yes they are the site of storage of vitamin a space of dizzy and one more space that i want to talk about is <coughs> space of mal what is space of mal you know it is very easy to identify the liver tissue in histology you can make out the central vein you can make out the classic hepatic lobule and at the ends like at the angles of the hepatic lobule the hexagonal lobule remember you see the portal triad what is the portal triad contain it has a branch of the portal vein branch of the hepatic artery and of course branch from the bile duct now yes the space immediately that surrounds the portal triad okay surrounding the portal triad okay so these hepatocytes in the periphery of the lobule they are called the limiting plate 
So this space between the limiting plate of hepatocyte and the portal trier is called the space of mal. It is also called the periportal space of mal. Right? So in the next exams, right, you can get a question like, where do you get to see Kupfer cells in the liver? In the sinusoid, in the space of dizzy, or in the space of mal? Yes, you should be able to answer the Kupfer cells, the macrophages, they are found lining the sinusoids of the liver, hepatic sinusoids. Done? Yeah. The next option was parietal cells, isn't it? Where do you get to see parietal cells? Of course, in the stomach. So, this is an histological image, okay, <coughs> of the yeah, stomach. So, what are the layers? You know, you have the mucosa, submucosa, the muscle layer, and the outermost will be the serosa or adventitia. And the mucosa has the epithelium, lamina propria, and the muscularis mucosa. So, in the stomach, what is the epithelium? It will be the simple columnar epithelium, right? Yes. And in the lamina propria, we get to see the gastric glands. Okay. So, imagine these are the gastric glands, right? So, this is the isthmus, the isthmus part of the gastric gland. And then we have the neck. And the lower part is called the base of the gland. So the isthmus will open into the gastric pit. Yeah, what are the types of cells you get to see in the isthmus? It will be the surface epithelial cells, the columnar cells, along with the parietal cells. Okay? And in the neck, we get to see the mucous cells plus parietal cells. What do you get to see in the base of the gastric gland? It will be mainly the sheep cells or the zymogen cells. Okay. So, parietal cells are seen in the isthmus neck. Less numerous in the base. Base has mainly the sheep cells or the zymogen cells. What is parietal cells going to do? It's going to secrete the HCL and intrinsic factor. You can identify the parietal cells here, right? They are large, triangular. They are acidophilic because they have large number of mitochondria. And yes, the chief cells, they secrete the yeah, gastric uh, enzymes, pepsinogen, renin, and gastric lipase. These are basophilic, right? Because they have like a lot of rough endoplasmic reticulum. Fine. So this is all you have to know about the parietal cells and the chief cells. And you should be able to identify in the histological image if you get it in the forthcoming exams. <coughs> now who's going to tell me what is this epithelium that you see here? Yes. You see? That is the pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium. Where do you get to see this epithelium? In the entire respiratory tract, right? So, we will call this as respiratory epithelium. What are the cells that you get to see in the respiratory epithelium? Yes, you can make out the tall columnar cells with cilia, right? The tall columnar ciliated cells, right? And the second one, yeah, the round, closer to the basement membrane, we get to see the round basal cells. Yeah. And the third one, similarly in the base, but more darker staining, can you see these cells? These are the, yeah, the neuroendocrine cells, Pulchitsky cells in the respiratory epithelium. And yeah, how can I forget all these empty cells which are secreting mucus? Those are the goblet cells. And then, of course, there's one more cell that you should know. The brush cells. What are brush cells? 
Again, these are columna, but they do not have a cilia. Instead, they have a microvilli. And it has been found that the base of the brush cells, they are related to nerve endings and hence they can serve as a receptor function. And coming to our question, Clara cells. What are these Clara cells? What are you supposed to know about these Clara cells? Okay. So if you go down in the respiratory tract, when you come to the region of bronchioles, what are the differences that you'll get to see that? Yeah. Remember, there's the cartilage, the hyaline cartilage, yeah, surrounding the trachea and the larger bronchus. So here in the bronchiole, there will be no cartilage, no glands in the lamina propria, okay? And then no goblet cells also as you go down. The very typical feature of the bronchioles is that it is started with abundant clara cells. Clara cells. So what are these Clara cells? Would you like to know more about it? The Clara cells are again columna cells. Yeah, they pointed it out here. Can you see? Columna cells. They do not have cilia. They have microvilli. They are found to secrete some surface active agent. Okay, typical of the bronchiole. Okay. Now, and the last one was the dust cells. The dust cells, where do you get to find it? Yes, in the lung alveoli. Yeah, so the alveoli, you can know the exchange of gas is intimately related to the capillaries. And there are two types of cells in the alveoli. The type 1 pneumocytes that you see here, they are the flat squamous cells. Okay, the flat squamous cells. And type 2 pneumocytes are these cuboidal cells with round nuclei. Which one is more numerous? The flat squamous cells, they occupy more surface area connected by tight junction. Okay, and here and there will be the type 2 cuboidal cells. And these type 2 pneumo pneumocytes are the one which is going to secrete the pulmonary surfactant. Now, what about our dust cells or the alveolar macrophages? They, they can be seen within the alveoli or they can be found to lie in the interalveolar septum. Right? Yes. So now, the kupfer cells are found in the liver hepatic sinusoid. Parietal cells in the stomach. Which part of the gastric gland? Yes, in the isthmus neck. In the base of the gland will be mainly the chief cells. Clara cells in the bronchioles. Okay, very typical of the bronchioles. And the dust cells in the alveoli of lung. Okay, and you know how they appear like, right? Okay, and there was this question, which of the following cells is not found in the molecular layer of cerebellum? Guys, remember, cerebellum is a very, 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 very important topic, okay? And over the years, every paper has some question from the cerebellum. Most of the time, it's from this histology part, right? <coughs> the cortex part. So, yes. So, you should be able to identify the histological appearance of cerebellum. This is how cerebellum looks like, the histological image. So, the cerebellar cortex is actually folded into leaf-like folds. These are called folia. That is what you are able to see here. Can you appreciate? This is all folia. Each folia, if you see, it will have an inner, inner core of white matter. Right? And an outer gray matter. Okay. This outer gray matter, we are going to call it as the cerebellar cortex. Yes. The cerebellar cortex has three layers. Okay. So, this pale area that you see here with a lot of, yeah, pale pink, that is the outer molecular layer. I'll zoom it a little bit. Okay. So, this is the outer molecular layer. If I zoom it a bit, can you get to see 
lot of small a single row of round 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 structures here that is the second layer it's called the purkinje cell layer this purkinje cell is very typical about cerebellum in cerebrum it will be the pyramidal cell right so there's a single row of purkinje cells which you get to see in the middle layer and then this innermost layer which looks more dense and compact that is the granule cell layer okay of course as the name implies you have lot of small granule cells but they are more densely packed right granule cell layer yeah so the outer molecular layer what are the cells that you are going to see two cells okay i'll show you in this picture the one which is situated close to the surface that is the skeletal cell skeletal cell yeah and the one which is situated a bit deeper in the outer molecular layer this one that is the basket cell yes so in the outer molecular layer how many cells are there two skeletal cell and basket cell they are confined to the outer molecular layer right now coming to the second one the middle purkinje layer middle purkinje layer just now we saw right what was the cell that the purkinje cells the purkinje cells are very important single row flask shaped right and the dendrites of these purkinje cells they go into the outer molecular layer and they extensively branch off we call it as dendritic arborization and a single axon that comes from the other end it passes through the other layers it will reach the yeah <coughs> inner gray matter <coughs> and synapse with the cerebellar nuclei so the axons of the purkinje cells they form the sole output of the cerebellar cortex and where do they go i told you to the intracerebellar nuclei please make a note of this point they have asked before these purkinje cells are inhibitory to the intra cerebellar nuclei remember their names dentate nucleus emboliform nucleus fastigial globus nuclei all that right and coming to the last layer the inner <coughs> granule cell layer so as the name mentions here we will get to see granule cells and i told you it is abundant closely packed right and one more cell the golgi cell so this is the golgi cell though it looks big it is not prominent because very few golgi cells are there so totally how many cells do you get to see in the cerebellar cortex around 5 right and remember all these five cells are inhibitory in nature except any idea what it is the granule cells okay only the granule cells are excitatory okay so these are the things you are expected to know and there's one more point i would like to add because they have asked previously yes the afferents i told you the afferents the sole output is the axons of purkinje cell the afferents that reach the cerebellar cortex is of two types what are they the climbing fibers and the mossy fibers so what are climbing fibers it includes the oligo cerebellar fibers and the par oligo cerebellar fibers all the other yes all the other afferents which can include the yeah spino cerebellar reticulo cerebellar or vestibulo cerebellar all the others are mossy fibers so what is the importance of that these climbing fibers they can come and synapse with single purkinje cell okay they influence only one purkinje cell very specific whereas the mossy fibers no all these afferents through uh, granule cells through the cerebellar glomerulus they can indirectly influence many 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 purkinje cells 
okay so these are the things you are expected to know and coming to the question back yeah so what is the answer which of the following cells is not part of molecular layer of the cerebellar cortex so in the cerebral outer molecular layer we get only two cells what are they the skeletal cells and the basket cells purkinje cells in the middle layer granule cells in the deep layer is that fine yeah so there was one question about the book test right and i'm sure 99% of you would have got it right yeah so this also we have been frequently discussed in our classes the book test is done for ulna nerve so this i told you is a very uh, important topic you can get an image based question clinical scenario so many things around it so what is book test you give a person a book in a hand to hold so this will be your left hand and the right hand can you make out the difference the left hand yes the thumb is closely applied to the book okay but the right hand how's the thumb yeah he is flexing his thumb to hold the book so which side is the abnormality the right side so why is this book test done to test which muscle yeah the thumb right which muscle of the thumb very 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 important adductor pollicis very frequently asked question what is the nerve supply to adductor pollicis ulna nerve the deep branch of ulna nerve okay so even in an image based question adductor pollicis you should be able to identify yes can you see here so this is the thumb yeah this is your little finger here you can see the thin ar muscles this one in the periphery will be the abductor pollicis brevis always the abductors will be in the margins okay in the thin ar it is the abductor pollicis brevis here it will be abductor digiti minimi okay and inner to it will be the flexor pollicis brevis here also in the hypothena the flexor digiti minima will be on the inner aspect where is the opponents if you separate the abductor flexor okay go between and beneath in between you'll get to the cd deeper aspect will be the opponents pollicis here the opponents digiti minima okay now coming to our muscle of interest this muscle that you see here the transverse fibers going towards the thumb this is the adductor pollicis so in an image based question also it is frequently asked and you should be able to identify okay and here these are the lumbricals the one two third and the fourth are bipinnate right okay so the book test is to test the uh ulna nerve injury and the muscle paralyzed will be adductor pollicis yeah so this part where the right hand yeah trying to flex and hold the book that is called the froemen's sign okay so uh, the muscle supplied by the median nerve and the ulna nerve yes very 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 important you should know yes what are the muscles supplied by the median nerve opponents pollicis the lumbricals four are there which one the first and the second the abductor pollicis brevis flexor pollicis brevis isn't it so apart from that i'm just talking about the muscles of the hand right intrinsic muscles of the hand apart from that all the other muscles in the hand that you see are supplied by the ulna nerve so what is it starting from the palmaris brevis which is on a superficial plane and then all your three hypothenar muscles what is the name of the three hypothenar muscles yes abductor digiti minimi flexor digiti minimi opponents digiti minimi and then what are the lumbricals that's left behind the third and fourth and then the interossei both the palmar and the dorsal interossei are innervated by the ulna nerve and not to forget our question adductor pollicis 
right yes so this you told me is the book test can we quickly revise the others also what is the name of this test card test right this is also to test ulna nerve but what is the muscle test it it's your palmar interosseae so you are trying to hold the card by adducting your fingers which is the action of the palmar interosseae what is this test it is the egawa test what you are trying to do here you are trying to move the middle finger on either side you are trying to abduct the middle finger right so this abduction is caused by which muscle the dorsal interosseae right <clears throat> and this one it's the wartenberg sign wartenberg sign yes by the little finger you are not able to adduct the little finger right now these are the tests for median nerve injury so what is this this is called hand of benediction yes yeah so what is the problem here not able to flex the distal phalanx of either the thumb or the index finger or the middle finger because of paralysis of flexor digitorum profundus that is innervated by the median nerve yes this is again called the pointing index same problem where the tendon fdp tendon to the index finger that is cut and that is supplied by again the median nerve and this they have asked like recently right pen test wow yeah so what is that done for to test the abductor pollicis brevis yes so do you know what is abduction of your thumb when the tip of the thumb faces the ceiling right when you are lifting the thumb up that is called abduction you take it across the palm this is abduction when you try to touch it with the other fingers the tip of the other fingers that is opposition and when you bring it in plane with the other fingers this is abduction okay abduction abduction flexion opposition so abductor pollicis brevis when you hold a pen you were trying to touch it by lifting the thumb yes that is the pen test and you know it is to test the median nerve right yes this is again eighth thumb what is the muscle paralyzed here opponent's pollicis right this is again the claw hand median claw paralysis of the lumbrical the first and the second lumbrical any idea what is this this is the ok sign what is the nerve involved anterior interosseous nerve what are the muscles supplied by anterior interosseous nerve it supplies flexor pollicis longus pronator quadratus and flexor digitorum profundus that flexes the yes the index finger and the middle finger so only when these muscles are functioning you can flex your thumb flex the index finger and make a perfect okay if not yes you get a bird beak appearance this is the okay sign okay yeah what are these tests this also has been asked recently over the previous years the phalanx test what do you do all these are for median nerve and very specific for median nerve compression in carpal tunnel which leads to carpal tunnel syndrome so how do you do this test in phalanx test yes you oppose the uh, dorsum of both the hands flexing the wrist to 90 degree so here again the median nerve is compressed okay tunnel test you just tap over focus over the median nerve in the carpal tunnel and darkan test you just compress okay you just press over the median nerve for 30 seconds so if the median nerve is injured in all these cases the test will be positive there will be paresthesia in the area of distribution of the median nerve okay so all these have been asked over the previous years and we have been teaching you nadia plexus right the next question yeah abduction lateral rotation flexion of thigh 
reflection of me and uh, it was a image based question that's what they were telling so this was 1 2 3 and 4 or a b c d right okay just one important clue here is flexion of knee what are the muscles which cause flexion of knee yes to cause flexion of the knee the muscle has to go behind the knee joint and pull it from back right yes so it should be a hamstring that is either semi membranosus or semi tendinosus or biceps femoris or the muscle that insert into the yes back the upper part of the medial surface of the tibia sartorius a gracilis also okay so these are the probable uh, uh, ones that you should pop in your mind on seeing this term okay now you can try to identify the muscles here so what is this one yeah the quadriceps femoris you know it has four components right so we'll label it as 1a 1b 1c 1a is rectus femoris right 1b will be vastus lateralis 1c will be vastus medialis what is 1d which is not seen here vastus intermedius if you remove the rectus femoris it will be lying on deep to it okay and then 2 yes 2 is sartorius you can see it originating from the notch below the antero superior iliac spine right and going towards the tibia this is adductor longus and medial to it that is the gracilis okay so this image based question yeah so sartorius yes which originates from the hip bone it crosses anterior to the hip joint you can see it going running like this and where does it reach it goes behind the knee joint to reach the upper part of the medial surface of tibia okay so you should know its relation to hip joint you should know its relation to knee joint okay so what is it doing at the knee joint flexion it is in, it can even cause medial rotation because it's inserting into the medial surface at the hip joint it is anterior to the hip joint right so here also it can it will try to pull the uh, femur towards the uh, yeah trunk it cause flexion of hip lateral rotation and abduction of the hip joint as you see here the hip is laterally rotated abducted flexed and the knee is flexed okay so you know this is the area of the femoral triangle which is bounded by medial border of sartorius and the medial border of adductor longus so here as you see here this is rectus femoris vastus lateralis vastus medialis here the rectus femoris has been removed you are able to see vastus intermedius okay so you won't have a problem in identifying sartorius coming to this muscle i told you the medial most muscle of the adductor compartment medial medial most muscle of the front of the thigh thin slender muscle gracilis this one inner to it adductor longus and inner to that this is pectineus right and coming from above the abdomen this one will be so as major and lateral to it from the iliac fossa iliacus right and you are supposed to know the movements taking place at the hip joint to answer this question so hip joint what are the movements taking place flexion extension right and then you have abduction adduction medial rotation lateral rotation so what is the chief flexor of the hip joint right 
iliosoas they've asked this before extensor of the hip joint which should come from behind right the main extensor of the hip joint will be the gluteus maximus and the hamstring am i right abductor the abductors of the hip joint are the gluteus medius gluteus minimus tensa fascia lata and sartorius adductus yeah you know it right adductor longus adductor brevis does adductor compartment right adductor magnus pectineus gracilis medial rotators there is a rule do you remember the muscles which are supplied by the superior gluteal nerve right which is gluteus medius minimus and tensa fascia lata yes they also cause medial rotation these three muscles which one gluteus medius gluteus minimus and tensa fascia lata they cause medial rotation of the femur right and uh, yeah lateral rotators please remember gluteus maximus and the short lateral rotators are the one which lie beneath it what do you get to see beneath the uh, maximus piriformis is the superior inferior gemelli with the tendon of obturator internus that we call it as tricipital tendon yes and quadratus femoris all these are lateral rotators of the hip joint also you should know about the knee joint movements yes what are they flexion extension what do you mean by extension when the knee joint is in the locked position isn't it so what are the muscles causing flexion of the knee joint hamstrings and a sartorius hamstrings includes the semi membranosus semi tendinosus biceps femoris okay extension is caused by the quadriceps femoris yeah so that's the one causing the knee joint anteriorly and inserting the right quadriceps femoris one more important muscle that initiates flexion right from the locked position which we call it as unlocking of the knee joint what is that muscle yes popliteus right so it's a very important topic and so many yes important points surrounding this so the muscle is sartorius this one hope you all got it right yeah this was the other question right tirion and its relations so you didn't have had a problem in identifying the tirion i suppose we have talked about it many more times so what is the yeah we'll do the question so tirion what are the four bones contributing to the tirion you can see the different colors right so here we have the frontal bone i'll take a different color black yeah so here this is the frontal bone this is the parietal bone this is the temporal bone and this one is the greater wing of sinoid so the tirion there are four bones okay contributing to it and then the options you have asked right which is the artery related to it we'll see so the middle meningeal artery is a branch of maxillary artery right and how does it reach the cranial cavity through which foramen foramen spinosum through the foramen spinosum it reaches the middle cranial fossa and there it will have a short trunk and then it will divide into two branches anterior branch which grows anteriorly so we'll call it as the frontal branch and one which goes behind that we'll call it as the parietal branch division so immediately beneath the tirion if you see here it will be the frontal branch right frontal branch of the or the anterior branch of the middle meningeal artery lies immediately beneath the tirion yes 
the other session also they have asked about tyrion like which one is the correct statements right so this is called tyrion rhyme it is formed by temporal parietal pinoid and the frontal not the maxillary right sideway blow waves will lead to fracture here and will uh, cause extra dural hemorrhage do you remember it's not the accessory meningeal artery it's the frontal branch of middle meningeal artery yes during my session i have given you like uh, important points to remember about the middle meningeal artery because it has been repeated over the years right so what are the things you should know about middle meningeal artery the branch of maxillary artery this is the mnemonic to remember the important points okay yes branch of maxillary artery that passes through the foramen spinosum but remember at its origin itself the auricular temporal nerve will have two roots so this middle meningeal artery will pass like between the two roots of the auricular temporal nerve yes that's what i have written here it passes between the two roots of the auricular temporal nerve yes it passes through the foramen spinosum it will be related to the tyrion and fracture of the tyrion will rupture the middle meningeal vessels causing extra dural hemorrhage and for that last yes just an additional point this will give rise to many branches and one of it is the superior tympanic branch so that you'll remember it right yeah yes this is also another repeat question important question the injury to the penile urethra extra vasation occurs in all except yes we'll see some anatomy and come back to it so for this you should remember a uh, anterior abdominal wall there is no deep fascia right instead we have only one fascia that but in the lower part of the anterior abdominal wall it's going to split into two layers uh, outer fatty layer called the campus fascia and an inner membranous layer called the scarpa fascia this scarpa fascia is going to continue below right before that you should know what is it going to continue with so this is the anterior abdominal wall and in the main this is the penis behind the penis that's the scrotum and this is the region of perineum okay isn't it so this scarpa fascia if you trace it further down right it becomes continuous with the fascia surrounding the penis the bux fascia and then over the scrotum the dartos of the scrotum and then in the perineum what happens it continues with the colis fascia of the perineum okay so something interesting is that to note about the colis fascia okay so now here this is the perineum you can see this is the yeah perineal membrane the inferior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm now our colis fascia what does it do it goes like this and fuses with the posterior aspect it fuses with the posterior aspect of the perineal membrane inferior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm so there is no communication about that what lies about that so below that we have the superficial perineal pouch above that will be the deep perineal pouch where you have the deep transverse perineal the sphincter urethra muscle all that okay now what is happening here when there is injury to the penile urethra so you see the urethra right so the urethra again so this is the i'll take another color mm, yeah so this is the prostatic urethra traversing the urogenital diaphragm that will be the membranous urethra this is the penile urethra so when there is injury to the penile urethra what will happen the fluid will accumulate in the superficial perineal pouch around the scrotum surrounding the penis and also extends to the lower part of the anterior abdominal wall i'll repeat it again when there is injury to the penile urethra where does the urine goes into the superficial perineal pouch and then yes becomes continuous surrounding the scrotum the penis around the penile shaft and even into the lower part of the anterior abdominal wall 
but it doesn't go to the not into yeah it doesn't it can't reach the deep perineal pouch right it doesn't reach the deep perineal pouch okay it can or it cannot also go to the thigh it can't reach the thigh because the scapa fascia will fuse with the fascia lata along the holden spine so it can't go to the deep perineal pouch above to the thigh below and yeah around along the sides we have the ischio anal fossa it cannot go to the ischio anal fossa because the pollis fascia right it's fusing with the posterior aspect of the perineal membrane so this has been asked like repeatedly guys we should be thorough with this topic so it can go to the superficial perineal pouch scrotum pineal sharp but not into the deep perineal pouch because pollis fascia fuses with the posterior aspect of the perineal membrane and the deep perineal pouch is situated above that we'll go to the next question hemibalismus which part is affected okay so this is all part of your basal ganglia right so what are the parts of the basal ganglia the basal ganglia has the corpus striatum claustrum amygdala the corpus striatum is further divided into caudate nucleus and the lentiform nucleus lentiform nucleus is further divided into globus uh, yeah the putamen and globus pallidus now this caudate nucleus and putamen together they are called neostriatum okay i think around five questions was been asked in uh, neuroanatomy combined both morning and afternoon session okay so globus pallidus right this will be the paleostriatum the caudate nucleus and the putamen is the receptive part of the basal ganglia whereas the efferents all begin from the globus pallidus so you should be able to identify these parts also that the caudate nucleus you can see the lentiform nucleus here the inner one is globus pallidus outer one is the putamen apart from that the subthalamic nucleus and substantia nigra function wise they are related to the basal ganglia now coming to these involuntary movements right yeah uh, what are those we have the chorea yeah what is chorea they are the jerky fast violent movements of the tongue face limbs and that is due to lesion of caudate nucleus easy to remember because both starts with c right and then acetosis like caudate nucleus and putamen always go together in function right acetosis what is acetosis and which part of the body does it involve it involves the distal part of the limbs that is the fingers the toes so these are slow sinuous writhing movements involving the distal part of the limbs and lesion of which part causes acetosis so remember tosis we write p t o s i s tosis so this is the pallidus the globus pallidum pallidus okay p lesion of the globus pallidus and then coming to hemibalismus hemibalismus like it involves the trunk the girdle these are like violent outburst okay and the limb will be flying in the air all that and this is because of the lesion of the thalamic nucleus coming to the two types of tremors that you know the intentional tremor and resting tremor intentional tremor is seen in cerebellar disorders resting tremor is seen in parkinsonism right what is the problem the lesion in the substantia nigra so our answer is here fine yes this is also a repeat question a very important question which has been asked repeatedly and we have taught you right trendelenburg test is positive due to <laughs> 
So what is Trendelenburg test? Okay. So as you see here, the right leg is off on the ground. The left leg is off the ground. So when the left leg is off the ground, the pelvis on the left side, the left pelvis will have a tendency to go down because there's no support due to gravity to try to get down right. But it is steadied. It is steadied by the contraction of the fibers of gluteus, medius and minimus of opposite side, right side, which are innervated by the right superior gluteal nerve. Okay. So, the right side steadies the pelvis of the opposite side. So, if my right superior gluteal nerve is injured, the pelvis will sink on the right side or on the left side. The pelvis will sink on the left side. Okay. So, coming to the point. Yes, you know, superior gluteal nerve supplies gluteus medius, minimus and one more. Yes, the tensa fascia lata, gluteus medius and minimus are supplied by the superior gluteal nerve. Okay. So, these three muscles are not only abductors. Just now we saw the actions in hip joint, right? Do you remember? What is the other action caused by these three muscles? They are the medial rotators of the hip. So, what is the option we can give as right answer? Not this. They do not flex. They do not flex. This should be the probable answer, right? So, if an image-based question, you should get answer right. So, that's why this is the gluteus maximus. This is your gluteal upper neurosis. Beneath the gluteal upper neurosis, only if you open and see, you'll get to see the gluteus medius. The small brown that you see here, that's the tensa fascia lata. Can you try to identify the muscles here? So the gluteus maximus has been cut. The gluteus medius is also cut. So this should be gluteus minimus. Just below the minimus, is the key muscle of the gluteal region, pyriformis. It is a very important landmark because the nerve that emerges below the pyriformis will be the sciatic nerve, right? And then here you have the tricipital tendon, the superior gemelli, inferior gemelli with the tendon of obturator internus. This is quadratus femoris, right? So, Trendelenburg gate, superior gluteal nerve, gluteus medius, minimus, tensa fascia lata. Yes, they cause abduction, lateral rotation of the hip joint. Yeah, this is a nice image. Yes, so derivatives of the pointed structures. Looking for the pointer, it is here, right? Yeah. So, what are the structures that you see here? What is labeled here? This is the NT, that is the neural tube. So, the neural tube is not marked, right? Below the neural tube, this N that you see here, that's the notochord. And to the side of the neural tube, this one which is labeled S, that's nothing but the paraxial mesoderm that is going to give rise to the sophites. So, what is the label structure? This label is placed where? To the side of the neural tube, which indicates the neural crest. Why so? Because initially there's the surface ectoderm. Part of the surface ectoderm thickens to form the neural plate. This neural plate then invaginates, right? The margins, you get the neural crest cells. Once the neural tube, it closes, fuses, the surface ectoderm closes. And you'll get to see the neural crest cells migrating by the sides and going to the other different layers deeper. Yes, so the market structure is the neural crest cells. 
and yes do you remember guys the 6 am morning session image based questions in embryology we did about the derivatives all the derivatives in embryology yeah so the neural crystals they give rise to lot of structures the connective tissue the bones of face skull the dermis of head neck and remember they migrate to all the pharyngeal arches right which is going to give rise to many structures in your head and neck right apart from that yes do you remember this mnemonic we learned to memorize the derivatives of neural crystals h is for heart what are the derivatives of neural crystals in heart yes cono truncal septum and the endocardial cushions that going to give rise to the semilunar valves the av valves in heart right what is c stand for the cells that is this one yes so the para follicular cells or the c cells of the thyroid gland the odontoblast the enterochromaffin cells the melanoblast and one more m yes can you tell me the cells of adrenal medulla yes and schwann cells the glial cells and even the leptomeninges the pia mater the arachnoid mater they are all derived from the neural crest yes g stands for the ganglia like almost all the ganglia right the cranial nerve ganglia yes 5 7 9 10 and then the dorsal root ganglia yes the pseudo polar neuron stack that and then the ganglia and the sympathetic chain yes and the pre iotic ganglia all those and the parasympathetic ganglia that you see in the head and neck the parasympathetic uh, ganglia and the wall of the git and elsewhere all these are derived from the neural crest so i think it was like many options were given yeah so people were able to recollect only few of them and then like multiple options were given pcb cbd cef all that right so what are the options like uh, over here which is correct cono truncal septum the sympathetic chain or the ganglia the melanoblast okay hope you got the others also right internal iliac artery branch uh, all of them are from posterior division except yes previously they asked about the anterior division do you remember so uh the abdominal aorta it divides into common iliac the right and left common iliac at what level l4 the common iliac is going to divide into internal iliac and external iliac uh opposite the sacroiliac joint this internal iliac is going to supply the structures within the pelvis this internal iliac okay will have a short trunk very short trunk and then it will divide into a posterior division and anterior division from the posterior division there are only three branches the superior gluteal artery will have the greater sciatic foramen it will go through the greater sciatic foramen above piriformis superior gluteal artery and one going above like that the iliolumbar artery and then the lateral sacral arteries of all the branches fourth from the anterior division and the posterior division the superior gluteal artery is the largest branch of internal iliac artery right from the anterior division of the internal iliac artery yes what are the branches we have the umbilical artery the proximal part of it will be patent to give the superior vesical artery remember the distal part will form the medial umbilical ligament we have the superior vesical artery then we'll have the middle rectal artery the inferior rectal will be continuation of yes the inferior mesenteric artery right uh, the superior rectal artery will be continuation of inferior mesenteric artery we have the superior vesical artery from anterior division the middle rectal artery inferior vesical artery in females this will be replaced by the vaginal artery 
and then yeah this is the inferior vesicle you can get to see the obturator artery yes in female again you'll get to see the uterine arteries ovarian arteries come from the directly from the abdominal aorta and then the two terminal branches are these the inferior gluteal artery and the internal pudental artery okay so branches of internal iliac over the recent years they've been asking again and again please be thorough of it so here uh, all except yeah i told you inferior gluteal and internal pudental are terminal branches from the anterior division of internal iliac yes guys did we, uh, we did revise it in our 6 am morning session right arteries from pharyngeal arches the question and the options were not much clear when i tried to compile either it was match or multiple options were given and you were asked like which was correct okay so we'll just go through it so how many arches are there totally there are six arches of which the fifth one will disappear completely right the remnant of the first arch will be the maxillary artery the remnant of the second arch will be hyoid and scapedial artery now these arch arteries anteriorly will open into truncus arteriosus right and on both the sides they'll be connected to the dorsal aorta the two dorsal aorta of both the sides lower down they unite okay and part of it here and there will disappear and you'll get the final structure but here you should understand the third and the fourth arch artery of both the sides they will open into the aortic sac the truncus arteriosus is going to divide into aortic sac and palmate trunk remember and the sixth arch artery will open into the truncus arteriosus so we'll do with the easiest one right what is the sixth arch artery going to give rise to yes the pulmonary artery is the arteries to the lung bud okay so yeah and what happens to the third and the fourth so this is the aortic sac i told you this is the right horn this is the left horn of the aortic sac okay now what happens to the fourth arch artery on either sides if you see this will be joined by the seventh cervical intersegmental artery okay so the right horn of the aortic sac will give rise to brachiocephalic trunk right you know the brachiocephalic trunk is on the right side it's going to divide into right subclavian and right common carotid the right subclavian artery it's going to have come from two sources one is the right fourth arch plus the right seventh cervical intersegmental artery right now what happens to the fourth arch on the left it's going to give rise to arch of aorta so the aortic sac the ventral part of it the left horn of the aortic sac the left fourth arch artery and part of the left dorsal aorta all of them will together give rise to this one this one this one this all of them will give rise to the arch of aorta so right and left it differs okay fourth arch fourth on the right and on the left the third arch artery you can see this proximal part of it will be the common carotid artery and a bud will come from that that's going to give rise to external carotid artery and then the third arch artery will give rise to the uh, will form the internal carotid this is part of the dorsal aorta right so the distal part of the internal carotid will be contributed by the dorsal aorta is that clear so we'll go to the option the first arch artery maxillary artery second artery remnants will give rise to hyoid and scapedial the third arch common carotid bud is external carotid 
and internal carotid has two uh, two sources right the third arch and part of the dorsal aorta so you know like what was asked right so depending on that you should be able to answer and the fourth arch on the right side it's correct proximal right subclavian artery because it's also contributed by the seventh cervical intersegmental artery on the right side and the sixth arch artery this is of course wrong it will give rise to the pulmonary arteries guys hope you got it right nerve injured to the marked structure so all the telling that the this is the fibula right the neck of the fibula was uh, marked so what is the nerve related that common peroneal nerve so this is also a repeat question the only the question is put in a different way but the topic is the same fibula neck of fibula nerve winding around is common peroneal common peroneal will divide into two deep peroneal superficial peroneal the deep peroneal nerve will go to the anterior compartment of leg superficial nerve a peroneal nerve will go to lateral compartment of leg and this is going to innervate the dorsiflexus of the foot okay tibialis anterior is star extensa digitorum uh, longus extensa hallucis longus peroneus tertius all that is there in the anterior compartment right and in the lateral compartment we get to see peroneus longus and brevis which are the everters of the foot so injury to the neck a fracture of the neck of the fibula can injure the common peroneal nerve the deep peroneal nerve is injured the patient cannot dorsiflex his foot and that will lead to foot drop yes you remember it has been asked repeatedly yeah so this was a nice question uh the entire question i mean the full framework of it though i didn't get uh, i think this was the related with the anesthesia given below the inguinal ligament i think to which nerve right which nerve is infiltrated when you want to do any surgery over the lower limb yeah so the options were lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh obturator nerve femoral nerve joint of femoral nerve so what are the nerves which are related below the inguinal ligament definitely it is not obturator nerve okay where do you get to see obturator nerve in the medial compartment of the thigh okay and it is not joint of femoral nerve joint of femoral nerve will pierce the anterior aspect of the swas major you can see it in the abdominal wall it's going to divide into two genital branch and femoral branch genital branch will be a content of the spermatic cord right and the femoral branch will come right along and it will supply the anterior wall i mean yeah part of the femoral sheath the skin over the anterior wall of the femoral sheath it will supply femoral branch then two options are that lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh femoral nerve the lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh that you see here of course it is that below the inguinal ligament and it's closely related to the antero superior iliac spine so when will this nerve will be uh, like blocked whenever you want to do any surgery over the lateral aspect of the thigh you are trying to remove a skin graft do a skin graft okay from the lateral aspect of the thigh in that case we can use the lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh but more commonly we choose the femoral nerve right this is the femoral nerve uh, you want to like anesthetize like block the entire lower limb then you have to go for both femoral and sciatic nerve block the femoral nerve is typically given block below the inguinal nerve so what are the branches coming from the femoral nerve from the trunk we have branches given off to pectineus iliacus and few branches to supply the femoral artery vascular branches then it will divide into anterior and posterior division and uh, usually we won't get much questions from lower limb but i think here this time it was like three to four questions both the sessions combined anterior divisions of the femoral nerve there are two cutaneous branches medial cutaneous branch medial cutaneous nerve of thigh intermediate cutaneous nerve of thigh and one muscular branch sartorius from the posterior division yes there's one cutaneous branch 
saphenous nerve. It's the longest cutaneous nerve, right, in our body. And then nerve to quadriceps femoris, right? So the probable answer here will be the femoral nerve. And this is another, again, a nice question. Segment of liver on CT image. And this, this pink color segment was marked. That was that. That was what they told. It's easy. There's just one clue that you should remember. Okay. So, you know, uh, liver like physiologically divided into how many segments? Eight. Right. So, these are the hepatic veins. How many hepatic veins are there? Three. The right hepatic vein, the middle hepatic vein and the left hepatic vein of which the middle hepatic vein is an important landmark as you see here which will divide it into a right and left lobe and the segment one is actually that okay so and another important clue uh, if you get to see all the three hepatic veins which means that it is uh, only the superior segments are seen okay and then the next thing is the portal vein this is the portal vein it has a left branch and then the right branch. So the left branch of the portal vein, what lies above that will be the superior part of the left lobe and what lies below that will be the inferior part of the left lobe. And the third point that you should remember is the right branch of the portal vein is on a lower level than the left branch of the portal vein. And uh, yeah, if you get to see the right branch of the portal vein, then it will be the inferior segment. And just know the name of the segment. Segment 1 is caudate lobe. On the left side, we have the left, left lateral superior 2, left lateral inferior is 3 and 4A, 4B. Okay, the medial segment is 4. 4A, 4B, 4B will be the quadrate lobe. And then on the right, we divide them into anterior and posterior. So, the segment 5 is antero-inferior, segment 6 is postero-inferior, 7 is postero-superior, 8 is antero-superior. Okay, so coming to the CT image, and uh, this is your IVC, right? So, here this is IVC, this is the right hepatic vein, the middle hepatic vein, this is left hepatic vein. So, what are the segments that you are seeing here? This will be 4A. Of the left lobe this is segment one caudate lobe this will be left lateral superior and here this will be eight and seven on the right side now this is the right branch of the portal vein still you can see part of the hepatic veins okay so this is also showing you the superior segment now you're getting you're getting to see the right branch of the portal vein inferior vena cava so i told you the right branch of the portal vein is an important landmark below which you get to see the inferior segment so this is important so here this will be 4b this is segment one of caudate lobe this will be three so on the right side yes this will be five the antero inferior this is post pro inferior now what is our question Yes. So here again, you get to see the three hepatic veins, right? This is inferior vena cava. So this again, the superior segments. Segment 4A on the left, 1, 2, 8 and 7. So the answer is segment 8, right? Hallmark of Clumkey's paralysis, okay? So we'll just see the options. I think this was asked in one of the sessions, okay, polisman tip, typically in herbs palsy, uh, wrist drop, radial nerve injury, claw hand you get to see in both median nerve and ulnar nerve injury and in clumkey's palsy it is C8 and T1 roots, okay, it involves both median nerve and ulnar nerve. Horner syndrome, there are many causes for it. Yeah, a tumor of the apex of the lung apart from brachial plexus injury. So the right answer will be claw hand. Just to rush to the features related to Clumkey's palsy and nerve palsy, what is the cause for Clumkey's palsy which is involved here? The lower trunk. 
So anything that can increase the angle between the upper limb and the trunk, we call it as the hyperabduction injury. What are the nerves affected? I told you C8 and T1, mainly the ulna nerve and the median nerve. You have seen about the nerve muscles, right? And the test channel for these nerves. So the intrinsic muscles of the hand, right? And the deformity will be typically claw hand. Of course, there is a sensory component because both median nerve and ulna nerve, they innervate the skin over the hand. One and a half, three and a half, you right, right? You know, right? Herbs palsy. Herbs palsy, what is the cause here? Injury to the upper trunk. Herbs point. I'm sure all of you know what is herbs point, right? C5, C6. Yeah, ventral rama united from the upper trunk. They both divide. And then two nerves coming. Nerve to subclavius, suprascapular nerve. So what is the deformity here in herbs palsy? What is the attitude of the limb? The arm is kept, adducted. Because you are not able to abduct and then it is kept immediately rotated because the lateral rotators are not working and the elbows typically kept extended. You cannot flex the elbow, the flexors are gone and the forearm, yes, you are not able to supinate, it is kept pronated. So the nerves involved will be musculocutaneous nerve. Axillary nerve. Yes, nerve to subclavius. Radial nerve. Suprascapular nerve. Okay, so the musculocutaneous nerve. It supplies what muscle? Yes, the muscles in the front of the arm, coracobrachialis biceps brachii yes and one more brachialis so these are the ones the biceps brachii and brachialis are the ones which is going to flex the elbow okay so if they are not uh, working then the elbow will be kept extended apart from that biceps is a supinator right so that's why you're not able to supinate the forearm and it is kept pro pronated what are the muscles supplied by axillary nerve it innervates the deltoid. Deltoid is the abductor and teres minor. Teres minor is a lateral rotator. That's why you're not able to abduct or laterally rotate. The arm is kept adducted and medially rotated. And the radial nerve, especially, yes, what are the muscles innervated by the radial nerve here? The brachioradialis is a flexor of the elbow and the supinator, which is supposed to cause supination, that's not that. And the suprascapular nerve, suprascapular nerve innervates two muscles. Supraspinatus is again an abductor, and the infraspinatus is a lateral rotator. Okay, here also sensory component. Remember, musculocutaneous nerve will terminate at the lateral cutaneous nerve of forearm. Right? The axillary nerve cutaneous branch, it has the up per lateral cutaneous nerve of arm, right? And of course, radial nerve also has a cutaneous distribution to the superficial branch. Yes, no doubt at all. Hallmark of Clumkey's paralysis, uh, injury to median nerve and ulna nerve, CAT1, claw hand. What is this market structure? Yes, this is also a repeat we have done in our revision. Uh, so, you should be able to identify the nerves coming out of the um, emerging out, right, from the brain. This is the olfactory nerve on the optic nerve. You see the optic chiasma, the optic tract. This is the region of midbrain. What you see on its ventral aspect will be the third nerve, oculomotor nerve. From the dorsal aspect, emerging will be the trochlea nerve. This is pons. Emerging from the pons. This is the fifth nerve. The motor root of the fifth nerve is small and medial, whereas the sensory root is large and lateral. This is the pontomedullary junction. Emerging from the pontomedullary junction, medial will be the sixth nerve, just lateral to it, its seventh nerve. Here, the motor root is medial and large. The sensory root, the nervous intermediate, is small and lies laterally. This is the eighth nerve. 
Now coming to the medulla here, from the anterolateral sulcus, just lateral to the midline emerging will be the 12th nerve. And here from the posterolateral sulcus above downwards, 9th nerve, 10th nerve, and the 11th nerve. You can see it's joined by the spinal accessory. So it's actually easy. Yeah. So pontomedullary junction, just lateral to the midline is nothing but the 6th cranial nerve, abducent nerve. Limbic system includes limbic system, right? So what is this limbic system? It receives motor information, sensory information and adds emotional component to the behavior. Like here also, I think multiple options were given and you were choose, supposed to choose the combination, the right combination. Yeah, I could get only these options. So we'll just see what is, a, what is it about. The limbic system, like three concentric circles from outer to inner, um, there are the parts of it. So the outermost one, we will get to see the cingulate gyrus, which will be continuous with the parahippocampal gyrus on the inferior aspect through the isthmus. Okay, the parahippocampal gyrus here, the end of it will be the uncus. So this will be the outer circle. And inner to that, we'll have the hippocampal formation. So it will be the hippocampus, the dentate gyrus, and the subicular complex. And then we'll have the gyrus facialis, the gray matter over the corpus callosum, inducium grecium. Now, the innermost, even the septal area, all that, okay, the innermost will be the output from the hippocampus, that's the fornix. The fornix is reaching the mammillary body of the hypothalamus. This will be projected to the anterior nucleus of the thalamus and then to the entorhinal cortex. From there again to the, yeah, the cingulate gyrus and the parahippocampal, the papi circuit, right? So these are the components of the even the olfactory area, the entorhinal cortex of the olfactory area, the anterior nucleus of thalamus. All these are components of the limbic system. So I didn't get all the options that was given for you, but hope your answer is clear, right? Yeah. Osteology, yes. This is also a repeat question. Jugular foramen syndrome. We call it as the Burnett syndrome, right? So trauma to the jugular foramen, which of the following is lost? So in an image-based question, will you be able to identify the jugular foramen? You should be, right? So this is anterior cranial fossa, middle cranial fossa, posterior cranial fossa. You can see the foramen magnum, right? Now where is this jugular foramen? This is the petrous part of the temporal bone. This purple is the occiput bone. This narrow white space that you see here, even this part, Right? That is the jugular foramen. Jugular foramen. This jugular foramen is actually divided into three compartments. Anterior compartment, intermediate compartment, posterior compartment. Anterior and the posterior compartment related to some sinus. So anterior compartment, the structure passing through will be the inferior petrosal sinus. Posterior compartment, internal jugular vein and the intermediate compartment, 9th, 10th, 11th cranial nerve. So he himself is given in the case scenario jugular foramen, right? But the options were related to tongue. Yeah, innovation of the tongue. So first, motor to the tongue. All the muscles of the tongue are innovated by hypoglossal nerve, except palatoglossus, right? That is innervated by the pharyngeal plexus contributed by 9, 10, and 11. And then anterior two-third of the tongue, general sensation, taste sensation, right? General sensation is by the lingual nerve. That's the branch of the mandibular division of trigeminal nerve. Taste sensation is by corda tympani. That's the branch coming from the seventh cranial nerve. Okay. And then posterior one third of the tongue, 
plus the circumvalid papilla right circumvalid papilla general sensation and taste sensation general sensation and taste sensation from the posterior one third of the tongue this region is by glossopharyngeal nerve ninth nerve and the posterior most part of the tongue what do you mean by posterior most part of the tongue this region you see here between the tongue and the epiglottis which we call it as the valicula so here the general sensation and taste sensation is carried by which cranial nerve the 10th nerve so now coming back to our option yes trauma to the jugular foramen which of the following is lost so the motor functions are retained taste sensation on the anterior two third is by the fifth and seventh so jugular foramen 9 10 11 right so this is also anterior two third is this is general is lingual nerve this is seventh nerve this is 12th and the pharyngeal plexus this will be the ninth cranial nerve which is passing through the jugular foramen am i right yeah pelvic diaphragm i think there was one question like this pelvic diaphragm is not formed by which one so the pelvic diaphragm is formed by levator ani and the coccygeus i'll show you a picture so yes image based question it is important to see the sacrum here right so from the anterior aspect of the sacrum this muscle which is originating and entering the greater sciatic foramen any idea what is it that is the piriformis this is the ischial spine originating from that and going towards the coccyx this is ischio coccygeus or just coccygeus now this is the tendinous arch of levator ani which is going to give rise to the levator ani these fibers yeah coming that from that part of the ilium and going towards the midline this is ilio coccygeus and coming from the front the pubis this is your pubic symphysis from this part this is the pubo coccygeus now pubo coccygeus and ilio coccygeus are together called levator ani okay that's what i told yeah so pelvic diaphragm is formed by levator ani and coccygeus this includes pubo and ilio coccygeus so pubo coccygeus ilio coccygeus and ischio coccygeus contribute to pelvic diaphragm and not obturator internus so any options other than these would have been incorrect yeah this is also a repeat question interesting question about the paranasal sinus and its drainage so what you see here in the image is see the lateral wall of the nose with all the concha yes so this is the inferior nasal concha the middle nasal concha superior concha and the space below that we call it as the meatus so below the inferior concha will be inferior meatus below middle nasal concha middle meatus below superior concha superior meatus now what is this sinus that see you are seeing here this is the pituitary can you see yeah the cella turcica with the pituitary and below that we have the sphenoidal sinus where does this sphenoidal sinus open into a zoom it a little bit just behind and above the superior concha can you see the small space here this space is called the pino ethmoidal recess okay so this is a very important question this topic is very important so what are the structures opening into the inferior meatus it's nothing but the nasolacrimal duct opening into the middle meatus i've told you in my class am fm what is that anterior ethmoidal middle ethmoidal frontal and maxillary sinus superior meatus receives the opening of posterior ethmoidal sinus and sphenoidal sinus opens into sphenoethmoidal recess right 
Yeah, the middle ethmoidal sinus, I told you, A, M, F, M. It can be made even more clear. So what is this bulbous structure that you see here? That's the bulla ethmoidal. Why is it raised? Because underneath it, we get to see middle ethmoidal sinus. So the middle ethmoidal, it opens into the surface of bulla ethmoidalis. Right? And below the bulla, can you get to see one brew-like structure, gutter-like structure? That's the yeah, hiatus semilunaris. And you see your opening here, that is the maxillary sinus. So where does the maxillary sinus open into? Into the floor of hiatus semilunaris. From the hiatus semilunaris, you can see something proceeding upwards. That's called the ethmoidal infundibulum. So, the anterior ethmoidal sinus will open into the anterior wall of ethmoidal infundibulum. Whereas the frontal sinus that you see here will open into the top, the upper part of the ethmoidal infundibulum. Is that fine? Yeah. Which of the, as I told you, like four to five questions were asked from neuroanatomy, both the sessions combined. And internal capsule, like God, yeah, it's very important, right? So we'll see something about that and then come back to the options. So what is internal capsule? It is a very compact bundle of projection fiber. What do you mean by projection fiber? It is starting from the cortex and going towards downwards, right? So if you trace it above, it will become continuous with the corona radiata. If you trace it below, it will be continuous with the crust cerebri of midbrain. It's the white matter, right? Now, where is it located? Medially, it will be related to the caudate nucleus and thalamus, laterally to the elentiform nucleus. What are the parts of the uh, uh, internal capsule? This is the anterior limb. This is the posterior limb. Between the two, we have the genu. And uh, yeah, behind the uh, lentiform nucleus, we have the retro lentiform part. And below, we will have the sub lentiform part. So, what are the fibers? passing through this internal capsule. We saw it as a projection fiber. So what are the fibers passing through it? The fibers which are beginning from the cortex, they are the corticopontine fibers, pyramidal and extrapyramidal fibers. So under the corticopontine fibers, we have the uh, fibers starting from different lobes. Frontopontine, yes, parietopontine, occipitopontine, temporopontine. And then we have the uh, pyramidal fibers. So pyramidal fibers are like uh, cortico, ending in the cranial nerve nuclear will be corticonuclear fibers, going towards the spinal cord, the pyramidal tract, corticospinal fibers. And then the third and the last one, extra pyramidal fibers. So what are these extra pyramidal fibers? Those are the cortico, all the other. The corticorubral, corticonigral, corticostriatal, all that will be the extra pyramidal fibers. Now, what you are expected to know is which part of the internal capsule these fibers are present. Because lesion to that, you should know like what are the symptoms produced by the patient, right? You should be able to diagnose it. So the frontopontine will be present in the anterior limb, in the genu, and in the posterior limb. Okay, majority of it. The parietopontine and the occipitopontine will occupy the retrolentiform part of the internal capsule. The temporopontine coming from the temporal lobe will occupy the sublentiform part of internal capsule. The pyramidal fibers, the corticonuclear fibers ending in the cranial nerve nuclei to supply the head and neck, they will occupy the genu. Right. And the corticospinal fibers, which are going to the limbs and the trunk, okay, as you see here, upper limb, trunk, and the lower limb, they will occupy the uh, posterior limb of the internal capsule. 
the extra pyramidal fibers are also present close to the pyramidal fibers in the posterior limb so this is the arrangement of fibers in the internal capsule which you should definitely know and the blood supply of it is also interesting so this is the internal carotid artery branch going from it above that the anterior cerebral artery then we have the middle cerebral artery anterior choroid artery posterior communicating artery so lower down we have the two vertebral artery uniting to form the basilar artery that will divide into posterior cerebral artery so branches from all this they supply the internal capsule we'll see one by one so the anterior cerebral artery will of course supply the anterior limb the genu okay now this these are called the striate branches some of these branches will be long and take a curve okay hence it will be called as the uh, the striate branches of this will be called as the recurrent artery of hubner the second branches coming from the middle cerebral artery they supply mainly the posterior limb but they get to supply the genu and part of the anterior limb also the striate branches of the middle cerebral artery like they have medial and the lateral striate branch the lateral striate branch are thin wall and whenever the pressure increases it can just rupture okay they are called the charcot artery of cerebral hemorrhage and then coming to the anterior choroid artery the anterior choroid artery it goes to supply the retro lentiform part and the sub lentiform part of the internal capsule and uh, branches coming from the posterior communicating artery and directly from the internal carotid artery branches coming directly from the internal carotid artery they go ahead to supply the genu okay and uh, branches coming from the posterior cerebral artery of course they inevitably supply the a uh, retro lentiform part the optic radiation the re retro lentiform part it carries the optic radiation towards the occipital lobe and the sub lentiform part has the auditory radiation towards the temporal lobe now coming back to the options right so the charcot artery what is that the lateral striate branch coming from the middle cerebral artery supplies the posterior limb yes internal capsule has projection fibers of course yes the cortico spinal tract fibers of upper limb and face they are present in the posterior limb of the internal capsule retro lentiform part has optic radiation yes yeah uh, like i didn't get the options for this question but i know this question was that yeah when i try to compile it Mm, patient having symptoms of Horner syndrome, uh, loss of sensation on the contralateral side of the body, ipsilateral phase with ninth and tenth nerve palsy features. Okay, and they were telling it was lateral medullary syndrome. Why medulla? Why do you want to tell it's only medulla, not pons or midbrain? Because mainly involving the ninth and tenth. Why lateral and not medial medullary syndrome? Yes, we'll see that. the lateral medullary syndrome also called the wallenberg syndrome why does it happen due to occlusion of the posterior inferior cerebellar artery that uh, supplies the posterolateral zone of the medulla what is that in the posterolateral zone of the medulla we get to see the spinal nucleus and tract of trigeminal nerve okay and then the lateral all the lateral structures that you see the the lateral spinothalamic tract nucleus ambiguous and then the cerebellar peduncle then the vestibular nuclei mm, anything left uh, the reticular formation the sympathetic fibers that 
Yeah, so all this will be mainly confined to the posterolateral zone uh, supplied by the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. So spinal nucleus and tract of trigeminal nerves involved in which means it's affecting the phase, right? And ipsilateral phase, sensation from that, since it is spinal nucleus, it will be pain and temperature. Lateral spinothalamic tract is crossed, right? So it's from the trunk and the limbs, the body. Contralateral trunk and limb, sensation is gone. Lateral spinothalamic tract, again, pain and temperature. So ipsilateral phase, contralateral body, sensations. Nucleus ambiguous is the one which is going to give rise to the, uh, yeah, the special visceral efferent column that's going to supply the muscles of soft palate, pharynx and larynx. So paralysis of the muscles of soft palate and pharynx. Yeah, larynx. The cerebellar peduncles, if it is involved, that lead to ataxia. Vestibular nuclear involvement like giddiness, right? Posture equilibrium. Reticular formation, the sympathetic fibers in the reticular formation, it will involve lead to a Horner syndrome that will present with meiosis, anhydrosis, enophthalmus, yes, loss of ciliospinal reflex and ptosis, not to forget. Fine. Medial medullary syndrome or the Dejerine anterior bulbar syndrome, the paramedian region of the medulla. So the paramedian zone of the medulla due to the branches that come from the vertebral artery or the anterior spinal artery, the paramedian branches. Okay. So here typically will be the involvement of the 12th nerve that you see here emerging to the anterolateral sulcus. Then you get to see the pyramidal tract. And what is this? That's the medial lemniscus. Right? So 12th nerve will present with ipsilateral, the same side, that half of the tongue will go for atrophy, paralysis, deviation of tip of tongue to the same side. Right? Yeah. Pyramidal tract, contralateral hemiplegia. Medial lemniscus crossed, right? So contralateral loss of two-point discrimination, vibration, stereognosis, proprioception, all those sensations, right? Posterior column pathway. So here in our case, yeah. So the features were pointing towards the, typically towards the lateral medullary syndrome. And like, yeah, there was one question, I don't know how very sure, what was the exact question, but it was about location of axillary group of lymph nodes. So the axillary group of lymph nodes are four in number. They are the epical here, okay, the anterior group, and then the posterior group, and then this one is the lateral group and central group. So... I don't know what was the exact question, but we can quickly discuss it. So the anterior group, it lies in the anterior wall of axilla. What is the muscle that you see here? Pectoralis minor. It lies along the lower border of pectoralis minor. Along which vessel? Lateral thoracic vessels. So where is it going to receive the limb from? From the mammary gland. Right. Anterior wall. The posterior one that I told you, the posterior groove, it lies in the posterior wall of the axilla along the subscapular vessels. It receives the limb from the posterior aspect, the dorsum of the trunk up to iliac crest. And the sen uh, lateral, the lateral group, which is also called the humeral group, okay, in the lateral wall of the axilla, it lies medial to the axillary vein. So the lymphatics from the upper limb, except those accompanying the cephalic vein, will reach here. And the central group of lymph nodes, right, that lies amidst the fat in the base of the axilla. And the epical group, it lies in the apex of the axilla. It receives limb from the upper part of the mammary gland. It receives the lymphatics from the upper limb accompanying the cephalic vein and from all the other axillary nodes. 
okay so the axillary tail of spines do you remember that will be in contact with the anterior group the intercostal brachial nerve intercostal brachial nerve that will be actually traversing the central group and i think there was one question asked about the which is the lobe or the segment involved in aspiration pneumonia which one yes so the right lung and the left lung how many bronchopulmonary segments are there 10 you should be able to name it right so this is the apical apical segment two is posterior three is anterior four is lateral five is medial so five segments in the upper lobe of the right lung coming to the lower lobe apical basal anterior basal lateral basal posterior basal medial basal 10 segments in the right lobe in the left lung also yeah upper lobe uh, yeah this is the middle lobe right upper lobe middle lobe and lower lobe on the right side on the left side upper lobe apical posterior anterior this we call it as superior lingular inferior lingular in the lower lobe it's the same apical basal anterior basal lateral basal posterior basal medial basal as you see here in the left lung there can be 8 to 10 lobes because the apical and the posterior segment can be seen as one single segment aerated by one tertiary bronchi and as you see here the 10th segment the medial basal can be missing okay so here the apical basal segment of lower lobe of the both the lungs that segment 6 is the one which is commonly involved in aspiration pneumonia also in lung abscess okay another thing they have asked over the previous years is which lies intersegmental okay which of the following structures is seen intersegmental so within one bronchopulmonary segment you will get to see branches of pulmonary artery bronchial artery and the tertiary bronchi but between the segments right you'll get to see the pulmonary vein so the pulmonary vein is intersegmental in position and it serves as a landmark for you to identify the segments during surgery right and this one i think it was asked in session 2 which of the following is not a boundary of triangle of safety okay i've seen like a many one many of them are discussing the right option mid clavicular line and one of the option was not uh, i couldn't figure it out okay yeah so what is this triangle of safety so it is a triangle that is chosen to insert the icd right in the tube now what are the boundaries of it apex of it the apex of this triangle is formed by the base of axilla anteriorly by what is this muscle you see here yeah that's the pectoralis major so the lateral border of pectoralis major posteriorly what is that this is the posterior wall of the axilla which has the latissimus dorsi so that will be the anterior border of latissimus dorsi and below the base will be line passing along the fifth intercostal space beyond from the nipple okay so the answer should have been the d option should have been like any of these okay so not a boundary will be the mid clavicular line and there was one cadaveric image about uh, terrible triad of knee okay so i didn't get to see complete question now of it it is also called the donal triad yeah so what are the three structures involved here it will be the medial meniscus yes the anterior cruciate ligament 
and the tibial collateral ligament also called the medial collateral ligament so to identify these structures here this is femur this is tibia the lateral condyle of femur medial condyle of femur so here should be the medial meniscus of tibia this is the lateral meniscus of tibia right now this is the anterior cruciate ligament posterior cruciate ligament okay and this on the sides outside the capsule this will be the medial collateral ligament or tibial collateral ligament over here you can see the fibular collateral ligament or the uh, lateral collateral ligament one more important structure is here the tendon of popliteus can you make out the tendon of popliteus which is intracapsular in origin so this is a very important image based question but you can make out all this now why is it called terrible triad because involvement when one particular structure of these three is injured the other two structures also can be involved commonly because of its close proximity as you see here this is the medial meniscus right the tibial collateral ligament uh, its periphery is atta attached to the periphery of the medial meniscus and this is the anterior cruciate ligament the anterior uh, horn of the medial meniscus is closely related to its lower attachment of the anterior cruciate ligament so the medial meniscus tibial collateral ligament and the anterior cruciate ligament okay they are in close proximity and they form the terrible triad of the knee joint mandibular nerve branches was asked and yeah i couldn't get the other options for this i think what was uh, true because i think this is also false this also false we'll see about it so what is mandibular nerve it's one of the divisions of the trigeminal nerve and how does it reach it passes through the foramen ovale to reach the infratemporal fossa what are the other structures accompanying it in the foramen ovale remember the male structures mandibular nerve accessory meningeal artery lesser petrosal nerve and the emissary vein on reaching the infratemporal fossa you'll get to see the trunk the trunk of the mandibular nerve it's going to divide into yeah anterior division and posterior division what are the branches coming from the trunk nervous spinosum that's going to pass through foramen spinosum and nerve to medial pterygoid it's important because it's the only branch coming from the trunk of the mandibular nerve to supply the muscle of mastication yeah this nerve to medial pterygoid is going to pass through the aortic ganglion to supply two other muscles tensor tympani and tensor palatini from the anterior division like we have four branches three of which is sensory and one or uh, three of which is motor and one is sensory so mesenteric branches temporalis branch nerve to lateral pterygoid all these are motor the buccal branch which comes from the anterior division is sensory okay and from the posterior division we have again three branches auriculo temporal nerve this is entirely sensory it also carries the post ganglionic fibers for the parotid gland and then lingual nerve we saw it supplies the sensation to the anterior two third of the tongue right it carry it's joined by the cauda tympani it delivers the post ganglionic sympathetic fibers to the sub sublingual salivary gland and submandibular and then the last one inferior alveolar nerve yeah it passes through the mandibular foramen in the mandible and before entering that it gives branch it gives a branch called the nerve to mylohyoid that not only supplies the mylohyoid but also the anterior belly of digastric so you should remember the mandibular nerve is the nerve of the first arch how many muscles does it supply eight muscles four muscles of mastication 
and four other mylohyoid anti repelli of digastric tensa tympani tensa palatini so this entire topic is very important make sure you are thorough it, okay i think we did this again but like there was one more question trendel and berg test is used to test superior gluteal nerve which supplies gluteus medius minimus tensa fascia lata right and these are all not only abductors of it but also cause medial rotation of the hip joint and it, oh, yeah i think there was one question asked i don't know in which session again uh, nerve supply of adductor pollicis yes you know it is the deep branch of the ulna nerve yeah i think this is the last question in appendicectomy bleeding is due to which artery i don't know like uh, this is the other option i'm not sure of this is the answer the iliopolic artery which is a branch of superior mesenteric artery so the superior mesenteric artery is given off at the level of l1 inferior mesenteric artery at the level of l3 what is the first branch of superior mesenteric artery it will be the inferior pancreatico duodenal artery after that you can see it giving rise to the middle colic right colic so this will be middle colic this is right colic this is iliopolic this is continuation of superior mesenteric artery this iliopolic artery is very important as its name tells okay it will divide into an ascending branch descending branch and all it goes ahead to supply the colic branch to supply the ascending colon ileal branch to supply the terminal part of the ileum it will give cecal branch anterior and posterior cecal branch and appendicular artery okay so this appendicular artery is an end artery right so guys yeah over the last few days i have tried to compile the whatever questions that has been asked in both the sessions and in anatomy like there were really close to 30 questions okay good number and yeah as you see here questions from from it was covered from all aspects of anatomy histology osteology embryology upper limb lower limb thorax abdomen head and neck neuro anatomy every part of it was covered as we saw histology those cooper cells all that was asked right osteology the question about therion the nerve around neck of fibula jugular foramen syndrome embryology like the ones we covered in 6 am session image based image based question derivatives of neural neural crest pharyngeal arch arteries and upper limb again book test hallmark of clumkey's paralysis axillary nodes lower limb the front of thigh muscles terrible triad of knee trendelenburg gait the one were repeated thorax about the segments of the lung triangle of safety abdomen yeah around five questions but the one repeaters only like penile urethral injury internal iliac artery branches segments of liver pelvic diaphragm appendicular artery and head and neck nerve emerging from that pontomedullary junction sphenoid sinus mandibular nerve branches neuroanatomy good number of questions the cerebellar cortex lateral medullary syndrome hemibalanceness internal capsule and limbic system so overall i think yes area plexus managed to cover entire set of anatomy questions that was asked in any set number 2022 hope you all made it right yes so in this session i try to compile it explain and uh, explain in detail so that all the topic of interest and importance has been covered and it will be useful for your forthcoming exams right if you are planning okay we'll wind up the session thank you